Hello, my name is Sharon Best. I'm a physician assistant from the University of Penn. I work at the Penn Memory Center. We specialize in seeing patients with cognitive complaints and memory disorders. So the Penn Memory Center is primarily a research department, but we also see patients in our clinic. So welcome to the first APP to APP lecture. We're so happy to have you. Today's lecture is on MRI interpretation for dementia focused on anatomy. So even though we're going to be honing in on structures that we look at to help diagnose patients with memory problems, you're going to be learning how to recognize normal anatomical brain structures as you scroll through your MRI. So the lecture is really targeted for any provider or, or clinician that would like to learn how to read MRIs better. So we start out very easy and go very slow. And eventually as we progress, the slides are going to become a little bit more challenging. So this, this recording is, has, is being done after the live lecture because I wanted to omit the polling questions. The Zoom polling questions do not show up on the recording, so they just sort of delay and waste time for someone who wants to review this afterwards. So we do invite you to attend our future lectures. You can see our website right here. We have a page that will tell you what's coming. Currently, we are offering a lecture once a month. We expect to increase that to twice a month in September. If you do choose to attend a live lecture, you have the opportunity to win a prize. It's an Amazon gift card. If you, if you compete in the APP2 challenge at the end of the lecture, which usually consists of about seven to 10 Zoom polling questions to see how well you have learned. Um, additionally, we do expect to have CME accreditation for our lectures soon, although we don't have that right now. Um, we're hoping to have that in about a month or two, perhaps from now. So we'll get started. So the objectives for tonight are imaging planes, T1 versus a T2 versus a flare, and of course, MRI anatomy pertinent for dementia. So we'll learn to recognize medial temporal lobe structures and atrophy, parietal atrophy, frontal temporal atrophy, small vessel ischemic disease, and also microangiopathy. So we'll first, we'll take a look at imaging planes. You're probably quite familiar with this. Sagittal plane is going to separate the brain into right and left sections. Axial plane will separate the brain into inferior and superior sections, whereas a coronal plane will separate the brain into anterior and posterior sections. So every structure that I mentioned to you, you don't have to worry about writing it down because if I mention it, it means it is, it is imaged and it is well labeled in a subsequent slide. So I'm going to start to mention certain structures that are important to us, and you can just sit back and relax and know that it will be on the slide for you. So right now, I'm going to take this and explain to you the way you're supposed to be thinking when you're scrolling through an MRI. So let's look at a coronal plane first. You should anticipate what you expect to see. So coronal planes, we should always start anterior and move posteriorly. So you would expect the first few slices on your MRI are going to be just frontal lobe, whereas the very early slice will be what we call the frontal pole, which is the most anterior portion of the frontal lobe. So slice would be frontal, 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 frontal temporal. So at the first point that you see that temporal lobe coming in, we're at the anterior temporal poles. So we're going to be frontal temporal, frontal temporal. Right now we're looking at a little bit of brain stem, frontal temporal brain stem. And then we're going to cross the central sulcus, which is the dividing line between the frontal and parietal lobe. So this slice, you're going to be looking at parietal, temporal, some of the brain stem. As you continue to move posteriorly, you would anticipate that you'll be looking at parietal, temporal, cerebellum, parietal temporal cerebellum, parietal occipital cerebellum, and then you will be completed. So likewise, on an axial plane, you always start at the base of the brain and move superiorly. So the first slice you're going to be looking at, you're going to know that it is the medulla of the brain stem and just cerebellum will, will be all that is in your view. As you move superiorly, you're going to get to this 
thickest part of the ponds right here. When you're at the thickest part of the ponds, we're going to learn to recognize how that's shaped. And you're going to know that at that point, you're right about looking at temporal poles and occipital poles. So the occipital pole is the most posterior section of the occipital lobe, and temporal poles are the most anterior portion of the temporal lobes. So at this particular slice, we're going to be looking at all temporal lobe with occipital lobe in the posterior aspect. And we'll know when we're at this level of the pons, this thickest part of the pons, we're right about here looking at temporal poles and occipital poles. As we move superiorly, it's all going to be temporal, occipital, temporal, occipital. We'll see the sylvian fissure come in, the dividing line between the temporal and parietal and frontal and parietal lobes. And we'll start to see that very inferior portion of the frontal lobe come into view. This is an important portion with um, dementia as well. It's called the orbital frontal gyride. So we're going to continue to scroll superiorly. And once we get above the occipital lobe, we can eyeball that slice of the MRI, and we're going to see that half of that is frontal and half is parietal. And we'll continue frontal parietal, frontal parietal, frontal parietal, and you're finished. So again, you want to anticipate what you should be seeing first on the sequence that you're looking at, and then you want to anticipate what you should be seeing in the next few slices. Okay, so now we're going to do a little practice. So I use this um, web-based program called IMAOs. And IMAOs has, is what I use to teach myself to read MRIs. It is about $95 a year for a subscription. You can also get a free version, but the free version is not as good. Oops. So we'll go here and we'll go back. So they go opposite of your typical scrolling with an MRI. So that can be a little confusing sometimes. You're going the wrong way. So we're going to go over what we learned so far. So the, this is an axial view. And so what you're going to be seeing is just medulla of the brainstem and cerebellum. So as we move superiorly, we're going to expect that medulla to change into the shape of the pons. So right now it's changing shape. So this is an inferior portion of the pons, and we're looking at something called the fourth ventricle that, again, we're going to be teaching you to recognize on subsequent slides. As we scroll superiorly, we now see the pons change to this classic sort of round appearance. So that is the pons when it's at its thickest part, right about here. And we are now looking at the right anterior temporal pole, left anterior temporal pole, this is almost all temporal lobe, all temporal lobe, and, post, and posterior aspect has occipital lobe. So here we have the cerebellum beginning to recede. As we move superiorly, we're going to expect that pons to change the shape to the midbrain because we have medulla pons and midbrain. So the midbrain looks something like a butterfly shape because it's associated with structures called cerebral crus which are large white matter tracts going to and from midbrain to the cerebrum. So at the level of the midbrain, when it looks like this, we're going to learn to recognize the right hippocampus and the left hippocampus. Structure is very important in memory. This is considered the medial temporal lobe structures. So again, we're all right temporal lobe, all left temporal lobe, occipital lobe in the posterior aspect. As we move superiorly, we're going to expect that above the midbrain, we have the thalamus. So now we're looking at the thalamus and that very inferior portion of the frontal lobe is starting to come in, the inferior frontal, the um, orbital frontal gyrus. So here we are still all temporal. There's your sylvian fissures and we're all temporal on the left and we're still some occipital in the posterior aspect because we're not yet above the occipital lobe. So as we scroll superiorly, we're going to see that we have basal ganglia begin to appear. So this is the head of the caudate nucleus. This is the putamen and globus pallidus. This is the right and left thalamus. This is called an insular sulcus, frontal lobe, 
and we still have just a little piece of the occipital lobe showing. Now we're going to get above the occipital lobe and we're going to see that once we're above, these two ventricles coalesce and become single bodies. At this point, we can eyeball this MRI. The anterior portion is all frontal lobe. The posterior portion is all parietal lobe. And then we continue superiorly till we're finished looking at our brain. So now we're gonna go back to our lecture. And periodically, we're gonna to go to IOMAOs in practice. So now you can recognize a sagittal plane, an axial plane, and a coronal plane. So I want to point out this, this gyrus right here. This is called the cingulate gyrus. I gave you a cartoon picture here. It's comprised of frontal, parietal, and wraps around and picks up in the medial temporal lobe that has been cut off out of this picture because you're looking at a midline slice. So that cingulate gyrus is very important in memory. We're going to see that the posterior cingulate gyrus atrophies early in Alzheimer's disease. With the frontal temporal dementias, the anterior cingulate gyrus will atrophy. So this little icon here tells you that this is worth memorization. So generally, I would suggest that you sort of understand what we're talking about and minimize memorization. T1 versus a T2 versus a flare. We have to take you back to undergrad anatomy. In undergrad anatomy, you remember that neuronal cell bodies make up the gray matter cortex, shown in like a darker, a little light brown here. They give rise to axons that course through the brain, down through the brain stem, some cross in the brain stem, others cross further down in the spinal cord. They exit through peripheral nerves, and this is a lower motor neuron terminating in a muscle cell. So the point we want to make is the gray matter here, okay, is considered cortical gray matter. It's considered neuronal cell bodies. Subcortical matter is myelinated white axons. So you can see that we have a deep gray nuclei here, and here, these are basal ganglia, and here. So deep means closest to the brainstem, whereas we're going to be calling those white matter structured subcortical regions. We call the peripheral cortex made up of the cell bodies. And then we also have gray matter being deep gray matter. So looking at this cartoon picture, you can see how these axons give rise and run in tracks. Okay, so a T1 versus a T2. This is a memorization slide. There's lots of tables and and ways to memorize the T1 versus the T2 on the internet, but the very simplest of all is this, and I assure you it will work every time. So gray matter, for a T1, gray matter is gray, white matter is lighter, this is your white matter axons, and CSF is darkest. So here's your basal ganglia, you're picking up here the deep gray matter structures, there's the thalamus, we have the peripheral cortex nicely seen in gray, Whereas a T2 is the exact opposite. The gray matter is lighter, the white matter is darker, and the CSF is lightest. So here we can see the cortical gray matter. We see the deep gray matter being the basal ganglia here on the right and left, thalamus on the right and left, head of the caudate nucleus, other basal ganglia. So now looking at a flare, a flare is simply a T2 with the CSF suppressed. And we do that for a reason. In this, in this particular slice, you can see these little fine caps. So this is small vessel ischemic disease, which shows us a hyperintensity on this film. And see how much better we can see it if the CSF is suppressed and made dark. If that CSF was light, we would miss little lesions that are periventricular. And as you know, MS has periventricular lesions. We can have bicuner strokes. We also can have small vessel disease. So for that reason, we use this flare to pick up different types of pathology. So the flare is going to be a T2, same thing, gray matter light, white matter darker, CSF, instead of being lightest, is suppressed, so it's very dark. So now we're gonna look at a little MRI, I mean a little uh, anatomy pertinent for dementia. So we've already mentioned the frontal pole, and I promised I would have everything I say on subsequent slides. We've already mentioned the occipital pole, 
we've already mentioned the temporal poles. We've mentioned that central sulcus, the dividing line between the frontal and parietal. And then we have a precentral gyrus, also called the primary motor cortex, and a postcentral gyrus, also called the primary sensory cortex. And of course, we have the inferior orbital frontal gyri that we mentioned that can atrophy early in frontal temporal dementias. We have some types of primary progressive aphasias, but that has a classic MRI appearance of an anterior temporal lobe atrophy, much more significant typically on the left than on the right. And that's called a semantic variant PPA. So we also want you to recognize a few other areas. You might remember Wernicke's area, which crosses temporal and parietal. This is an area that often atrophies very early in Alzheimer's disease and some of its variants. So this is not going to affect memory as much. Obviously, this will affect language more so. The medial temporal lobes that if we pull this temporal lobe off and look on the inside are the hippocampus and the parahippocampal gyrus. Those are the areas that are really, really important for memory. So here we also have Broca's area. You may remember Broca's area for broken speech. We have different types of frontal temper dementias. One that's called agrammatic non-fluent primary progressive aphasia is actually a frontal temporal dementia. It's a neurodegenerative disease and the neurons are dying off in this area more so. So this area will atrophy early on in the disease and the patient will have a problem forming normal sentences. They'll have abnormal syntax or they may have a praxia of speech where they're having trouble putting those words together. So now we're going to just look at the brainstem. You remember the medulla, pons, and midbrain. And of course, on the MRI, you're going to see that best at a mid-sagittal section where you can see the medulla, pons, and midbrain. So just above this midbrain, you have a thalamus. You can see here the cerebellum nicely. This is an occipital lobe. This is a parietal lobe. This is the frontal lobe. So this particular sulcus here is called the posterior cingulate sulcus. If you remember that cingulate gyrus we talked about, here's the anterior portion, here's the parietal portion, and it would wrap around and pick up on the medial temporal lobe here. So in early Alzheimer's disease, this medial parietal lobe structure known as the precuneus often atrophies early, resulting in a widening of this posterior cingulate sulcus. So let's look at some MRIs and recognize the brainstem. So I've labeled the brainstem for you here, A, B, and C, being medulla, pons, and midbrain. So above the midbrain, we have the right and left, left thalamus, and lateral to that, we have basal ganglia. So at your first base of the brain, you're going to stop when you see the medulla shape like this, and you're gonna recognize, and you would anticipate that all you would be seeing is cerebellum. And as you scroll superiorly, you're going to watch that medulla change the shape of the pons. And as you scroll to that center thickest part of the pons, the pons is going to be shaped like this. And that's a shape that you're gonna memorize to know that P for pons is P for poles. So here you're looking at anterior right temporal pole, anterior left temporal pole, and occipital poles in the posterior aspect there's the cerebellum starting to recede away. So this is all right temporal lobe, all left temporal lobe, occipital lobe in the posterior. So remember with that semantic variant PPA, sometimes this anterior temporal lobe is just obliterated, but it's usually a classic finding where this is much more atrophied than the rest of the cortex, and even as compared to the left temporal lobe, anterior temporal lobe. Moving superiorly, you're going to expect that brainstem to change to the shape of the midbrain. So at the midbrain level, we have the right hippocampus and the left hippocampus, and we're gonna look for these structures to atrophy with early Alzheimer's. So now I wanted to make sure you understood that when we have a coronal section, the brainstem can look very different. So here's the midbrain. It's associated with cerebral peduncles, just large white matter tracts going to and from the midbrain to the cerebrum. Whereas we have the pons 
is associated with something called middle cerebellar peduncles, again, comprised of large white matter tracts going to and from the pons to the cerebellum, hence its name. And then lower in the medulla, we have the olives and pyramids. So now we're gonna practice with Imaos again. Okay, so we're going to take a look again and we're gonna go over exactly what we did a few minutes ago. We're gonna start at the base of the brain where we see the medulla. We recognize and anticipate that all we should be looking at is cerebellum. As we begin to scroll superiorly, we expect that brainstem to change shape of the pons. This is the very inferior pons associated with the fourth ventricle. As we go superiorly, we're going to look for that pons to be that nice round shape. And at that point, we'll know we're at about the thickest level. And P for pons, P for pulse. So this is the right anterior temporal pole, left anterior temporal pole, posterior aspect with occipital poles, all right temporal lobe, all left temporal lobe, occipital lobe here, um, a little bit of the cerebellum still showing here. And we would anticipate that next we should see the midbrain. And there's the midbrain associated with the cerebral cruise, right hippocampus, left hippocampus, Posterior aspect still has the occipital lobe that we would expect to be there. Right temporal, left temporal. As we scroll up, we expect to see the thalamus. So here's the right and left thalamus. Here's the right and left sylvian fissure. Here's the preorbital um, frontal cortex. So the uh, inferior orbital frontal cortex associated with some of our frontal temporal dementias. Frontal lobe continues to come in. Right sylvian fissure, left sylvian fissure. We anticipate that we're going to be seeing basal ganglia come into view. Right and left head of the caudate nucleus, again, part of the basal ganglia. Here we have putamen and globus pallidus, basal ganglia. Here we have right and left thalamus. And we would expect that we're going to see these ventricles coalesce into single bodies. And when they do, we're going to eyeball this slice all frontal, all parietal. Now we know we're above the temporal lobes and we're above the occipital lobes. All parietal and frontal, parietal and frontal, et cetera. Then we're gonna take a look at a coronal view. So we know we're looking at the anterior frontal pole right here. So as we scroll posteriorly, we're all frontal, all frontal, all frontal, we're gonna anticipate the anterior temporal lobes coming in. Frontal, frontal, there's your temporal lobes coming in. So here's your anterior temporal pulse. The left, highly associated with the semantic variant PPA. We're going to continue. We have nice sylvian fissures showing here. This is superior, middle, inferior temporal gyri, superior, middle, inferior. We have nice basal ganglia showing here, these deep brain structures. We have subcortical white matter showing well, running in tracks between the basal ganglia. And we have the cortex that we can see. We're all frontal. We have not crossed the central sulcus, and we'll know we crossed it when we begin to see quite a bit of the cerebellum. So now we're ready for that cerebellum to show up. Oops, went the wrong direction, sorry. So now we've seen the brain stem come in and we're gonna anticipate the cerebellum. There's the cerebellum. As we continue now, we've really probably just about, we're just ready to cross that central sulcus. And then we're looking at all parietal with occipital here. And we're gonna to continue to go posteriorly. And as we go more and more posteriorly and we see the cerebellum disappear, we know that the parietal lobes are disappearing and we're gonna be looking at mostly all occipital lobes. So now we're gonna go back to our lecture. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about the thalmi and the basal ganglia. So we have a right and left, right thalmi, left thalmi. This is a cartoon picture. We're start to orient you with the medulla, the pons, the midbrain.
Superior to the midbrain, we expect to see the thalamus. Lateral to the thalami, we expect to see the basal ganglia. So this red structure here is the globus pallidus. The structures out here in maroon are caudate nucleus and putamen. So these are the three basal ganglia that you have to memorize, and it's only those three. Here's a brainstem, medulla, pons, midbrain, with the thalami at the top, thalamus at the top. Now we're gonna look at corona radiata, internal capsule, and we're going to um, relate that in proximity to basal ganglia and thalami. So looking on a coronal view, we've talked about this being the cortical gray matter made up of cell bodies gives rise to axons. The axons are going to course in tracks down through the brain, through the brain stem, through the spinal cord, and they're either coming in towards the brain, as you know, such as sensory being afferent neurons, or they're going away from the brain being efferent neurons. So here we have a special track that we call the internal capsule. So we have a, an anterior limb, a genu where you usually see it bend, and a posterior limb. You can't really appreciate it bending here, but you can appreciate it bending here. So here's your anterior limb of the internal capsule, the genu, and the posterior limb. So we have our white matter is very dark, and that's a white matter track. Here we have the head of the caudate nucleus, here we have the putamen and the globus pallidus, the basal ganglia you're going to recognize. So moving forward, we're going to look at the basal ganglia and thalami and internal capsule on an axial view. So here we have the white matter is darkest, the gray matter is lighter, and the CSF is lightest, so you're looking at a T2. So here we have everything marked for you. We have the frontal lobe, here's the frontal poles. We have the head of the caudate nucleus, one of the basal ganglia. Out here, they've labeled this the lentiform nucleus, but the lentiform nucleus is named that. It's a combination of the globus pallidus and the putamen because together they look lens-shaped. So here we have the anterior limb of the internal capsule. We have the genu or bend, like a genuflect. And then we have the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Here we have thalamus on the right, thalamus on the left. So now we're going to look at the basal ganglia and thalamus from a sagittal section. So sagittal sections are always going to start from the left side of the brain and move across the midline and exit out the right side of the brain. So if you remember that coming up the brain stem, you have the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain, and to the lateral sides, you have the thalami, and lateral to that thalami, you have the basal ganglia. So as we're coming in from left to right, we're going to see uh, just a section that looks like this. And if you continue to scroll forward, you'll see the brainstem come into view. So you know you're at the midline. So if you're at the midline, you've just passed your basal ganglia. So, so we're going to see basal ganglia first, then we're going to see our brain stem where we can see the medulla pons and midbrain. Then we're going to see the thalami and basal ganglia coming out the right side. So now taking a look at the ventricles, we have to learn a few of the, the areas of the ventricles a little bit better. So this we're going to call the central bodies. You probably remember that we have a left lateral ventricle that's comprised of all of this a right lateral ventricle, one midline third ventricle, and one midline fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is anterior to our cerebellum and posterior to the pons. So we wanna recognize this area of the lateral ventricles and name them the central bodies. This is considered frontal horns because it's positioned in frontal lobe occipital horns because they're generally going to be showing up in the occipital lobe. And of course, we have temporal horns showing up in the temporal lobe. The other area of the ventricle you want to recognize is right here, and this is called the atrium. So the atrium is the expansion at the junction between the occipital and temporal horns.
Okay, now within those ventricles, you have a specialized ependymal cell called Cori plexus. The Cori plexus, if you remember, is responsible to synthesize and secrete CSF. So sometimes we can see that Cori plexus on the MRI. I also want to introduce you to something called the choroid fissure. It's a cleft that forms on the medial wall of the lateral ventricle. So they're talking about right here. So right here is an area, which is the medial temporal lobe areas, and that's going to be an area of focus for early Alzheimer's disease. We're going to look at this choroid fissure. It's filled with CSF fluid. And when the hippocampi are quite large and robust, it abuts this cori fissure and keeps it somewhat closed. When the hippocampi get very small, we're going to see that cori fissure widen. So now let's take a look at the fourth ventricle. So beginning at the base of the brain, you recognize the medulla, and you know at the level of the medulla, all you're looking at is cerebellum. You'll see a little black circle, a little bit hard to see here, but that's the fourth ventricle. So as you scroll superiorly, you're going to see the pons begin to come in, and you're going to note that the fourth ventricle looks kind of like an unhappy face. So if I can bring your attention right here, recall that this fourth ventricle is anterior to the cerebellum, but posterior to the pons. So this is right about where you are when you're seeing that unhappy face. So as you continue to scroll superiorly and you move up, so you're at the widest level of the pons, you're above the fourth, you're, you're not quite above it, you're getting a little nip of it. So the fourth ventricle will look again like this. So we have a basilar pons, which is the anterior portion of the pons, and we have the tegmentum of the pons, which is the dorsal portion of the pons. Okay, so now we're gonna look at hippocampus, the temporal horn, thalamus, basal ganglia, and a few other structures like the collateral sulcus and the calcarine fissure. So looking at your axial sequence here, you recognize already that you're at the level of the midbrain because you can see the brain stem shaped like the butterfly. So at the level of the midbrain, you know that if you look just lateral, you're going to have gray body structures called hippocampus. So your right hippocampus is here, left hippocampus is here. So generally that hippocampus is very close to the temporal horn right here. So we're going to see a little bit of CSF peeking through. If these hippocampi get quite small and atrophied, which they do in early Alzheimer's disease, you're going to see this widen quite a bit. So the temporal horn will enlarge and that will be a clue for us. There's also something called a collateral fissure pictured on this particular slice right here. Now the collateral fissure is actually a fissure that runs almost from the occipital pole all the way to the temporal pole. So it's running medially almost from here to here on the medial aspect. So if you know on the medial temporal lobe here, we have hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus. In other words, the cortical structures that are surrounding the hippocampus if that parahippocampal gyrus is getting atrophied early, which it does in Alzheimer's disease, this particular sulcus is going to look wide. So that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at a widened collateral sulcus due to atrophy of the parahippocampal gyrus. So now moving, I've given you a, a slice approximately of where we are. So you can see that this slice is taking a little bit of the front of the temporal horns and it's cut right about here. So here you are all right temporal lobe, all left temporal lobe. You have occipital lobe posteriorly and cerebellum is receding away. As you move above the midbrain, you anticipate the thalamus coming in. So right and left thalami. At this area, you anticipate the very inferior orbital frontal gyri starting to show up. So that's right here coming in. A right sylvian fissure, a left sylvian fissure, all right temporal, all left temporal, occipital. Here we have a little piece of the atrium of the lateral ventricles. So remember that's about here. So the atrium was the area that we were going to recognize being halfway between or the junction between 
the occipital horn and the temporal horn. So a little piece of the atrium of the lateral ventricles showing with CSF. We have a little piece of the occipital horns, so you know you're in occipital lobes here. And then we can see again a little bit of this, this thalmi is sort of superimposed upon the globus pallidus a little bit, kind of hard to tell them a little bit apart. So now as we're going to look at the third ventricle, so recall the third ventricle is a midline structure. It's single, not, we don't, we don't have two of them and we have one midline fourth. So looking at this third, it looks kind of like the picture. It looks like a little bit of a slit. So we're gonna recognize that right when the preorbital gyrus start to show up. As we continue to move superiorly and we can start to see the basal ganglia a little more clearly with that internal capsule, we will notice that the third ventricle will look like this. And on a coronal view, it looks about like this. So as we continue to move superiorly, we're going to now be above the occipital lobe. We're going to be above that sylvian fissure. So we can eyeball this slice and say about half is frontal and half is parietal. There's your central sulcus dividing the two. So we can see that these central bodies have coalesced. We have a little bit of deep brain structure, deep gray matter here being basal ganglia. We have a new structure we're introducing called the insular sulcus. So if you remove this temporal lobe and you removed a little bit of this frontal and a little bit of this parietal, we have a deep lobe called an insular lobe. So that insular sulcus begins to widen with some of our PPAs, our primary progressive aphasias, particularly that agrammatic non-fluent type. Additionally, we want to recognize that cingulate gyrus so remember this cingulate gyrus comprised of frontal, parietal, and medial temporal lobe cortex. So here we're looking right about here at the parietal, also called posterior cingulate gyrus. So also at this level, we want to recognize all the sulci here that we're just going to collectively call intraparietal sul sulci. So the reason we look at these closely is because in an early Alzheimer's disease, they're going to widen earlier. The reason is because the parietal cortical atrophy occurs early in Alzheimer's. Whereas in the frontal temporal dementias, being behavioral variant, frontal temporal dementia, the most common, but then we also have the semantic variant PPA and we have the non-fluent agrammatic PPA. They're all frontal temporal dementias. So we'll notice that the frontal lobes will be more atrophied out of proportion to the rest of the cortex. So again, I've labeled that central sulcus for you, but that's not easy and it doesn't matter much because you're gonna eyeball this slice and you're gonna say to yourself, half is frontal and half is parietal. So let's look at parietal atrophy a little bit closer. So we've already introduced to you this cingulate gyrus which is a midline structure. So it's just, there's one on the right and one on the left. It's very close to the midline. So we're going to now identify that medial parietal lobe called the precuneus. So the precuneus has the posterior cingulate sulcus dividing it from the frontal lobe. And it has the parietal occipital sulcus dividing it from the occipital lobe. So here's that cingulate gyrus again comprised of the frontal, parietal, and wraps around and it's showing you medial temporal on this image. So again, if the precuneus is going to atrophy with parietal lobe atrophying early and in greater proportion to the rest of the cortex with an Alzheimer's dementia, we would expect to see this posterior cingulate sulcus to widen. We may also expect to see the parietal occipital sulcus widen. We also have other types of dementia, like Lewy body's dementia, as well as the posterior cortical atrophy, which is one of the variants of Alzheimer's, that has a dorsal parietal occipital atrophy. So you may also notice widened sulci on those as well. So this is called the codum scale. So the codum scale is looking at parenchyma being primarily the precuneus atrophy, 
whether, but it can also be parietal atrophy in general. So the quotum scale is going to measure two parameters, parenchyma and sulci. It's particularly looking at um, parietal atrophy, whether there's none, mild, substantial, or end-stage knife blade. With regard to the sulci, they're really looking at the widening of the two sulci that I've just taught you. So we have grade zero means this person is totally normal. We have one mild, two substantial, and three end stage. At Penn, we don't really use the codem scale, but we do say a mild, moderate, or severe parietal atrophy. So looking at some MRIs on the sagittal section, we see cerebellum, occipital lobe, we see the parietal occipital sulcus, and then we see the posterior cingulate sulcus, and there's the precuneus. Looking at a grade one, we see a little bit of widening of this posterior cingulate sulcus, a little bit more widening of the parietal occipital, and maybe a little bit of atrophy of the precuneus. Looking at the sagittals, we really don't have very widened sulci here. This is pretty normal looking, but you can see that the intraparietal sulci on this slice is a little bit wider. Whereas going to a codum score of two, you can see that that posterior cingulate sulcus is quite wide. We have an intraparietal sulcus that's also wide, and we have the parietal occipital sulcus that's quite wide. And we can see that we do have a quite a, a moderate to severe atrophy here in the parietal lobes bilaterally, a little bit worse on the left. And here we have a knife blade atrophy of the precuneus and a very wide posterior cingulate sulcus and parietal occipital sulcus. And really the parietal lobe is almost obliterated. So you can see how the atrophy here in the parietal lobe is quite out of proportion to atrophy in the frontal lobe. A normal aging, the brain will atrophy diffusely and sort of even globally. So we're looking for atrophy out of proportion to the rest of the cortex to make our diagnoses. So here's posterior parietal atrophy a little bit more showing you those intraparietal sulci being quite wide in relation to the frontal sulci. And here's a coronal view. So we've crossed that central sulcus because we can see a lot of the cerebellum here. So this is really the parietal lobe left here. And this is occipital here. So now we can see this is the parietal occipital sulcus. So we're parietal here that's practically obliterated more posteriorly, and there's your occipital lobe that isn't quite as bad. So now we're going to look at some of those medial temporal lobe structures. So we'll look at the cingulate gyrus we've talked about quite a bit on many slides, pictured here for you in green, comprised of the frontal, parietal, wraps around and picks up on the medial temporal lobe. The hippocampus is pictured for you here in red. It has a CA to C1, a dentate gyrus and a subiculum. What we're gonna recognize is the head, the body and the tail. We're also going to recognize the parahippocampal gyrus, which is the cortex around the hippocampus pictured in green. And you can also see that here. So looking at an axial view, and I'm going to remind you how long that hippocampus is, head, body, and tail. So on an axial view, realize you're going to be cutting like this. So you're going to get a long view of the hippocampus. So it's going to look quite long. This is head, body, and tail. And now you know you're looking at the midbrain because of the shape of the brainstem. So lateral to the midbrain, right hippocampus, left hippocampus. This is a little piece of the temporal horn showing here. This is a little piece of the atrium of the lateral ventricles. So on a sagittal view, the hippocampus is going to be just lateral to the globus pallidus starting to come in, or excuse me, to the basal ganglia starting to come in. So again, we have the head, body, and tail pictured from anterior to posterior, head, body, and tail. What's going to give away that you're looking at the hippocampus is going to be this atrium. Remember that portion of the lateral ventricles where the junction is between the occipital horns and the temporal horns. So when this comes in, the basal ganglia 
is just going to start to show. So you are lateral to the midline. So you'll come across and you'll see the left hippocampus first, then you'll see the basal ganglia, then the thalami, then you'll see the brainstem at the medulla pons and midbrain where you can see all three structures well at the midline. Then you'll cross the midline. You'll look at the thalamus, the basal ganglia, and then you'll look at the right hippocampus. So it's going to give you a clue that this is very atrophied is the atrium is going to get very big. So now we're going to look at the coronal view. This is actually the very best view for us to ascertain hippocampal atrophy. So the hippocampus looks like this on the coronal view. We're at the medulla and the pons of the brainstem. We have a right sylvian fissure, superior, middle, inferior, temporal gyri, superior, middle, inferior. So here we have a left hippocampus with a little piece of that choroid fissure peeking through. And I gave you that definition here if you forgot what that was. So here we have a little piece of the choroid fissure. If temporal horns were showing, they would be right here and right here. And here we have a, that another view of the collateral sulcus. Remember that sulcus that goes from the occipital pole all the way to the temporal pole. So we're going to be looking at widening of the choroid fissure, widening of the temporal horn, and widening of the collateral sulcus, in addition to decreased height of the hippocampal body. And that's how we're going to ascertain hippocampal atrophy. So remember, as we age, the brain would normally atrophy and get a little bit smaller, so we do have normal aging memory problems. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, these medial temporal lobe structures and posterior parietal cortical structures are actually atrophying at a greater rate because the neurons are dying off in that area. They're believed to be dying off in that area due to proteinopathy. So we know that amyloid plaques build up and we know that tau tangles build up. And even though we have this new aducanumab, the anti-amyloid drug out, there might be a little more evidence to show that the tau is going to be more significant of where the clinical symptoms are going to show up, where the tauopathy is. So we're going to look at something called the medi uh, medial temporal atrophy or Shelton scoring system. So again, at Penn, we don't use this particular MTA score, but it's good to know. But when we talk about hippocampal atrophy, we usually just say a mild, moderate, or severe. So looking at this coronal section, we can see that we have a widening of the choroid fissure and it's kind of coalescing with the temporal horn here. And we do have a decreased body. This is actually an MTA score of two. An MTA score of zero, the choroid fissure, the, the temporal horn and the hippocampal height are all totally normal. So with a score of one, the only thing you're going to see is a little bit of widening of the choroid fissure. With a score of two, you're going to see a little bit of each, a little bit more widening of the choroid fissure, a little bit of widening of the temporal horn, and a little bit of decrease of height in the hippocampal body. And as we move to a score of three and four, all of those are just going to worsen. So what's really important to remember is that at age 75, a, a Shelton score of two or greater or a, the Shelton score must be equal to two or greater than two to be considered abnormal if they're under 75. If the patient is older than 75, they actually have to have a Shelton score of at least three or greater to be considered abnormal. So that's where the skill and the challenge comes in is when the patients are 80 or, or, or 90 and we have to try to figure out if this hippocampal atrophy is out of proportion for normal aging. So we really base a lot of weight on the clinical picture. If you remember the history and physical exam gives you 90% of diagnosis. So we really have to have a clinical picture of Alzheimer's disease. And we also do some cognitive testing and there's patterns that would show up. And then our MRI just can give weight to or take weight from what we think is that diagnosis. Here's an MTA of zero with a nice closed Cori Fisher good height of hippocampal bodies, and really none of the temporal horns showing. MTA of one, choroid fissures are definitely widening. MTA of two, 
choroid fissures and temporal horns widening, decreased height of the, of the hippocampal body. And then we can see how that the, this CSF is, is even wider and showing up more. So we have a greater atrophy of this hippocampal body. And now we can really see that collateral sulcus right here, definitely getting wider. So, and we can see how the MTA score of four just gets very profound. Here you can barely find the slither of the hippocampal body. So now we're going to look at that axial view again, and we're going to pick up that collateral sulcus here, because remember, it goes from temporal poles to occipital poles. So we pick it up here when the temporal poles are just starting to come in, and we can pick up that collateral sulcus here as we have moved superiorly, and we're now at the level where we're looking at the hippocampi. So we're going to do a little practice again. Okay, so we're just going to go over what we learned. We're going to start at the base of the brain, where we see the medulla and the cerebellum. We're going to scroll up and we're going to expect that medulla to change the shape of the pons. And then we're going to expect to see that fourth ventricle like a sad face. So there's your pons, the tegmentum of the pons, basilar pons, unhappy face is your fourth ventricle. This is the inferior temporal gyri starting to come in, but the middle temporal gyri really has the anterior portion. So when we get to that pons that's shaped like a nice round ball, we have P for pons, P for poles, right anterior temporal pole, left anterior temporal pole, right occipital pole, left occipital pole, cerebellum, all temporal, all temporal. As we go superiorly, we expect to see that midbrain. At the level of the midbrain, we've got the right hippocampus, left hippocampus, a little bit of the collateral sulcus coming in here. Cerebellum almost disappeared. Occipital lobes here, right temporal, left temporal. Going superiorly, we expect to see the thalamus and basal ganglia come in. And at that point, we expect to see that preorbital gyrus right sylvian fissure, left sylvian fissure, thalamus and basal ganglia. We have atrium of the lateral ventricles here and here. We're all temporal, all temporal, still occipital. Now we're go scrolling up and we expect to see that nice basal ganglia and very clearly along with the internal capsule. So here we can see head of the caudate nucleus, Lentiform nucleus comprised of the globus pallidus and the putamen, right thalamus, left thalamus. We have ventricles with a third ventricle right here. We have that posterior cingulate gyrus right here. That's important for us for Alzheimer's. Insular sulcus here. This is an area of the frontal lobe covering the insular lobe called the frontal operculum. And that is the parietal operculum, the area of the parietal lobe covering that insular lobe. So, and you can see the internal capsule as we mentioned. Scrolling superiorly, we're going to see those lateral ventricles, central bodies, collates. And at this level, we're going to eyeball about halfway through. We're now looking at all frontal and all parietal. And there's that central, that cingulate gyrus that we expect that to be atrophied in Alzheimer's, where in Lewy body's dementia, this is typically spared. And we have a special sign that we look at on a PET scan called the cingulate island sign. It is kind of a hallmark of Lewy body's dementia. The next lecture that we have with MRI interpretation and in clinical cases, we give you some of those images. So we'll give you MRIs and PETs. Scrolling superiorly, we continue to look at frontal parietal. We're going to pay special attention to the intraparietal sulci. We're and we're going to pay special attention to the frontal sulci. Frontal temporal dementias will be widened out of proportion here. Alzheimer's variants and Alzheimer's disease widened out of proportion here. We'll take a quick look at the coronal view. 
we expect to see this nice frontal pull at our first slice. And as we begin to move posteriorly, we're going to watch for the temporal poles to come in. So the anterior temporal poles should show up. There they are, right and left. And as we move superiorly, we're going to see that nice sylvian fissure. We know we're all frontal lobes. We have basal ganglia here and here. We have a nice internal capsule here. We're going to continue to scroll posteriorly. We're going to expect to see the brainstem come in. And then we're going to expect to see the cerebellum come in. And then we know when we have a lot of cerebellum, we've crossed that central sulcus right about here. And we're going to continue to go across so we know we're looking at all parietal and occipital, parietal occipital, parietal occipital, and pretty soon we're all occipital. Now we're going to go back to our lecture. Now we'll look at frontal temporal atrophy on some MRIs. So here we have an axial two and an axial flare. And you can actually see a bit better on the flare, the frontal atrophy. So if you look very closely and you compare, this person really has atrophy more profound on the right as compared to the left. With frontal temporal dementias, we often find that the right is affected more than the left, whereas with Alzheimer's disease and the variants of Alzheimer's disease, we often find that the left side of the cortex is more profoundly affected. So looking here, remember at a coronal section, we can see a really nice view of the frontal lobe like this, because remember our first several slices are all frontal lobe. So we can see that we have a right frontal atrophy in greater proportion. Now looking at the coronal, we can pick up here that we have a widened sylvian fissure compared to the left side. So we have a very wide right sylvian fissure. We can clearly see that we have wider sulci on the right of the frontal lobe compared to the left. And so this is a frontal temporal dementia. Okay, so another hint that we have a frontal or a parietal uh, atrophy in greater proportion is looking at the ventricles. When the cortex has been atrophied, the ventricles can look larger. So if you look very closely, you can see that the frontal horns are larger compared to the parietal, compared to the horns that are in the parietal lobe. So this gives us a hint too that this frontal cortex is more atrophied than the parietal. So here's, I'm pointing out some widened sulci as well. So this is the behavioral variant FTD. So now we'll look at small vessel ischemic disease and then we'll look at microangiopathy and then we'll conclude the lecture. So the small vessel ischemic disease, we look at lesions of two types, periventricular lesions, being lesions around the ventricles, as well as white matter lesions that are considered to be within the white matter. So a fascicus score of zero has neither. A fascicus score of one is going to have little caps or thin lines around the ventricles, and perhaps some little, what we call punctate foci. So they're hyperintensities on your T2 or flare. So obviously we're going to want to flare because we're going to want to suppress the CSF so we can see these periventricular lesions best. So here you can see punctate foci. A fascicus score of two, those little caps and lines are going to extend to become what we call smooth halos. And the little micro, the little punctate hemorrhages are going to start to coalesce. And then as we move to a fascicus score of three, these caps are going to extend into the white matter. And then we're also going to have large confluent areas of the white matter lesions. So a fascicus score of one is actually normal in elderly, but two and three are considered pathological. And they can be seen in cognitively normal individuals, but they're considered at very high risk for cognitive decline. And to make that point, there was a really interesting study called the Lattice Study that was done between 2001 and 2009 across 11 European countries with 639 enrolled and an impressive 633 completed.
So the patients were aged 65 to 84, and they were functionally autonomous. So that means we measured their autonomy and they could take care of themselves with regard to basic activities of daily living, washing, hygiene. They could also do um, things like finances and drive and manage their meds and appointments. So they really had um, either no disability or mild disability assessed at the beginning of the study. And the MRIs were found to have either mild, moderate, or, or severe small vessel ischemic disease, and they were ranked with the FASICUS scores. So interestingly, at a one-year follow-up, those patients that had a FASICUS score of one, 9% of them went from being completely autonomous to needing someone to care for them. That's what they mean by a functional disability. 15% of those with a FASICUS score of one became, or excuse me, 15% with a FASCUS score of two went from being totally autonomous to needing someone to care for them. And those with a FASCUS score ranked as three on their MRI, 26% of them went from autonomy to disability. So you can see the correlation with the small vessel ischemic disease with the higher FASCUS score being a high risk for having uh, cognitive problems. And then also at a three-year follow-up, they looked at how many patients that were actually functionally disabled died. And there was 10.5 versus 15.1 versus 29.5 for a FASCUS score of one, two, and three respectively. So it was an interesting study. Now we're gonna look at microangiopathy. So we're going to look, um, we're, what we need to understand first is we always want to use an MRI sequence called uh, SWI or the GRE. These are the sequences that are going to show up blood products. So they'll show up uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages, uh, just like they would show micro hemorrhages. So the caveat is, is that if these little micro hemorrhages are located in peripheral cortical areas, Okay, you know now we're at midbrain, right temporal, left temporal, occipital. So the microhemorrhages here are in right temporal lobe, left temporal lobe, and left occipital lobe. And they're clearly worse on the left than the right. So because these are cortical regions, gray matter cortex, we attribute these more to cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So just like amyloid builds up in the brain between the cells for Alzheimer's disease, we have amyloid building up around the small vessels and they have a tendency to cause inflammation and hemorrhage. So here we see that we have one single micro hemorrhage. So we can tell where we are because we see these central bodies of the lateral ventricles of coalesced. So we can eyeball this. We're about half frontal, half parietal. So we have one microhemorrhage in the right parietal lobe. So one microhemorrhage we don't worry about a lot. We usually have to have two or three, but if this particular person had a great story for Alzheimer's disease and a you know, MTA score of three for hippocampal atrophy, we're gonna say this is probably due to cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Whereas when these microhemorrhages are deep, so now you know you can recognize the lateral ventricles the atrium portion here. You know that we're around basal ganglia here. You can kind of see that. So these, the deep brain structures are considered basal ganglia, pons, and they lump the cerebellum into that. So when we have micro hemorrhages in what we classify as deep brain structures, we, we attribute that more to chronic uncontrolled hypertension. So there's something else called superficial siderosis. So what that means is it means that the blood products are deep in the sulci. So if you remember the pia arachnoid and dura membranes that are covering and protecting the brain, the pia and arachnoid dip down into the sulci where the dura is more attached to the skull. But the arachnoid membranes contains the little tiny blood vessels. And that's where we have the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we see that that hemorrhage can just float sort of unimpeded through the soul side. So when we have blood products in, or excuse me, when we have cerebral amyloid angiopathy, 
that are in those little tiny blood vessels in the subarachnoid space, and they are going to have inflammation and, and hemorrhage, then that blood is going to sort of course through the soul side, just like a subarachnoid hemorrhage would. So here they look like little snakes because of where, they're, where the blood product is positioned. And we sometimes can measure them. So depending on our story again, um, if we see these in cortex of patients that are, have memory complaints, we often will suspect cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Now, mind you, I had a patient the other day that came in with a very early memory issues. We did an MRI that was somewhat equivocal. And we also did a PET scan to really confirm that the underlying was really, we did an FDG PET scan and we did confirm the underlying etiology was Alzheimer's. Now she happened to have superficial siderosis in her right frontal lobe. So that doesn't go well because her PET scan had showed us that she had hypometabolism in the posterior parietal lobes. And um, for that reason, going along with her clinical picture and cognitive testing, we told her the underlying driver of the problem was likely Alzheimer's, so we can enter her early into some of our research studies. However, she had this little superficial siderosis. So when she came back to see me, I had asked, you know, had you had a fall? And she and her husband and her partner actually remembered that about two months prior to the initial visit, she had fallen and hit her head, but she didn't have any medical eval and felt it was fine. Well, she apparently hemorrhaged and in the frontal lobe. So that really had nothing probably to do with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So we have to sort of take the whole puzzle pieces and picture and put them together. So in summary, we've looked at imaging planes, sagittal, axial, coronal. We looked at how to tell the difference in a T1 versus a T2 versus a flare. We looked at some basic MRI anatomy so hopefully now you can recognize hippocampal atrophy, the widen, which the Shelton scoring system takes into place widening of the choroid fissure, widening of the temporal horn and loss of height of the hippocampal formation. Parietal atrophy being associated, the posterior parietal atrophy is associated with Alzheimer's disease and its variants. Its variants are um, uh, an early onset Alzheimer's disease, the late onset Alzheimer's disease that we all know of, we have a posterior cortical atrophy that presents with visual problems because of the area that's affected, the dorsal, parietal, and occipital lobe, and memory spared. And we also have something called a logopenic variant of primary progressive aphasia that is most often driven by underlying Alzheimer's disease. Those patients present primarily with language problems and unable to repeat a sentence, but their memory is often somewhat spared in the beginning. We also have frontal temporal atrophy. We have a few variants of that, behavioral frontal temporal dementia, where behavioral is the prominent symptom. We have a semantic variant, primary progressive aphasia, where the patients actually lose the knowledge of what words mean. And we also have the agrammatic non-fluent primary progressive aphasia that's a frontal temporal dementia. So hopefully you would learn to ascertain between parietal atrophy, frontal temporal atrophy. We explained a little bit about the correlation between small vessel ischemic disease and patients losing their autonomy and becoming functionally disabled. And we also looked at microangiopathy, looking at deep cortical brain lesions, probably associated with hypertension, with peripheral cortical lesions, probably associated with a cerebral amyloid angiopathy and superficial siderosis with the same. So there's my references. And I'm gonna end the lecture by just giving a little sort of shout out for the next APP to APP lecture that's coming. It's called Imaging for Dementia with Clinical Cases. You can sign up for that again on our website. And if you do wanna to come to that, I've given you a preview slide about four functional cognitive systems, and we're gonna relate them to MRI and PET imaging. So it would be amazing if you really wanted to learn and grasp that lecture, if you would familiarize yourself with this slide. So um, 
basically we have four functional cognitive systems, which means that when the patient gives us a story, we're gonna put them into one of these four categories. We're gonna put them into memory and learning as primary complaint, or vision and object recognition as primary complaint, or speaking and language as primary complaint, or behavior, attention, or executive functioning as primary complaint. So you can see that once we hear the history, we're going to pick one of these functional cognitive systems, and then we're gonna know what to look for and expect on the MRI. So tonight we did a little bit about the memory and learning. We talked a lot about Alzheimer's disease. And with those particular patients, you know now that we expect a medial temporal lobe atrophy, that being hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus, a posterior cortical atrophy. And we would expect on the MRI, on the SWI sequence, the cortical microbleeds or superficial siderosis. So I won't go into everything, but you can read this, but it would be helpful and you would really grasp the lecture well if you would just, if you wanted to, you could familiarize yourself with this slide. It's really a course slide for the next lecture. And the next lecture is also going to review a lot of the anatomy that we've done here tonight. So you don't have to have come to this lecture or looked at it. But if you do, it's going to really give you a head, um, a jump start. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. It was my pleasure to give our first AVP to AP lecture. Um, again, we invite you to go to our website, app to app.org right here. And we invite you to take a look at it and we come back for more learning. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good night.